Uh, I asked if I could be part of this year's lecture series because I feel that it's important for our students to understand what we say as teachers in the context of what we do as practitioners. I'm not suggesting that our teaching is somehow legitimized by the fact that some of us build buildings. I believe that architectural ideas can be represented in words and drawings as surely as they can in buildings. But I do not believe that words and drawings are experienced in the same way as buildings. Architecture, as differentiated from architectural ideas, at least for me, resides in the realm of inhabitable, built form. For years now, Stanley has referred to the studio products of certain teachers here as autobiographical. By this, he meant that the work produced in a particular studio looked like the architectural work done by that teacher. I've always believed that this was not the case uh, in my studios, that the work of my students does not look like the work that I do, that teaching architecture is not the same as asking students to share in the process of one's own architectural research. However, this lecture is intended as a kind of acknowledgement of the autobiographical character of the morphology and the typology courses that I've been teaching for the last couple of years. Uh, I like to think that it's the idea content of these courses that shapes and directs the work uh, that I do. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to do tonight is to try and relate some of that work, which I'm going to show you, to a selected set of typological and morphological issues. Those are big words, right? So for the few of you that have somehow escaped my clutches in the last couple of years and haven't had me as teacher, maybe it's worth uh, a few quick definitions. Typology is a comparative study of architecture divided into categories based on shared characteristics. By analyzing architecture in this way, we can discover reoccurring and perhaps significant issues of structure, construction, formal and spatial order, and thematic issues of use that have given buildings form. Morphology is the study of form. The sequence of nine square volumetric exercises that constitute the first year graduate morphology course deal not only with making geometric form but with the geometric ordering of forms in space, as well as the process of ordering and giving form to space. While these courses use Euclidean geometry as the basis of order, I do not believe that this is the only or even the right way to create architectural order. Now, it's rumored that Stanley reinstated uh, the study of morphology and of typology into the curriculum because a certain visiting critic complained that he couldn't do a museum project with the third-year grad students because they didn't have the faintest idea what a museum was, uh, and that he actually asked Stanley whether or not anybody teaches anything about typology in this school. Well, in the absence of a normative understanding of architectural principles, this visiting critic couldn't teach the students to make architecture by subverting our conventional understanding of architecture. It turns out uh, that you can't subvert something that you don't understand. Now, I believe that one can build a legitimate methodology of design on the process of critical subversion as an intellectual starting point. However, it seems that the primary objective of maybe too much of contemporary architecture is just to create new forms. One of the things that I believe is that architecture is too important <clears throat> and too expensive in terms of human labor and materials to become a product of fashion-driven change. But what about ideologically driven change? Believing that architecture should express the spirit of the age was an important aspect of 20th century modernism. However, the spirit of the age was easier to believe in when it didn't change every few years. What architects believed to be the God's truth with respect to appropriate form and design methodology has changed three times in the 20 years I've been practicing architecture, and no doubt it will change again. <clears throat> I believe it's important to ask what social, cultural, and scientific changes may mean for architecture but in the end, it seems incredibly egocentric of architects to believe that architecture is the central endeavor of mankind and that every scientific or cultural invention <clears throat> or change in social pattern, that is, every new idea, must have an architectural importance 
resulting in new architectural form. Okay. I have just a couple of more general comments that I'd like to make before we get to look at some pictures. Uh, I want to acknowledge the importance of the numerous talented people that I've been lucky enough to work with over the years. Uh, very few people make architecture all by themselves. And much of the work that I want to show you tonight is actually part of or the result of a collaborative process, uh, uh, first with my former partner, Anders Nerim, and with my present partner, Julie Hacker, both of whom, by the way, are UIC graduates. The work that I'm going to show you is a selection of both early and recent buildings. Doing this allows me to present the development of certain typological ideas as well as recurring spatial themes. The title of this talk, uh, Br did Bruno mention the title of the talk? I think he avoided it. You know, it's one of those things somebody says, oh, what are you going to talk about? I don't know. I'm going to talk about my work. We need a title, right? Make up a title right now. So the title is called uh, Transformations of Typology and Tradition. In any case, um, that title suggests the method or suggests a method that works from uh, typology. That is a method that works from a normative understanding of a thing either by transformation or by a re kind of restatement. Uh, let's see, what I want to do is to begin uh, and show you some furniture as a kind of microcosm of architecture. Uh, incidentally, this was the problem, I'm teaching first year graduate students now, and this was a problem that was posed to the first year grad students during the first seven and a half weeks of the term. Uh, as a way to think about the problem of designing the, uh, a chair, the first year students were actually encouraged, uh, and, and I think that this is a, a really good idea, encouraged to subvert the idea of a chair uh, as a structurally stable object that's independent of the sitting user. That is, it's, the idea is it's not a chair until you sit on it. Um, the chairs that I want to begin and look at, rather than uh, rejecting the conventional understanding of what a chair is, uh, fits into a very specific uh, way the general category of chair. Okay, I guess I can get the slides by uh, pressing these. Okay. Up. Oh, no, I'm, I'm in trouble already. Can you back up the one on the right-hand side? No. Nope. Back up. There we go. Yes. Um, do I do that? Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. I feel like I'm going to fall off the stage because one of the things that my students know is that I like to point at images when I talk about them. In any case, uh, uh, our, the library chair that I want to show you, which are not the two images here, uh, was actually built for a library that Julie Hacker and I designed for ourselves, which, which we'll look at in a moment. But the idea of a, a special chair, uh, which is a library chair, that is a kind of multi-functioning chair that opens into a library ladder or a step stool, is described in these two slides. The one on the left-hand side, the steps, as you see, folds out of the chair. It was actually designed by Ben Franklin. The one on the right-hand side is a uh, uh, Regency-style chair, and you can see that the steps actually zigzag and nest, uh, so there's a very different idea about what the mechanism is, but in both cases, the idea is that there's a, a concealed ladder here. Uh, this is the chair that we did, and it, it uh, in a quite uh, straightforward way, uh, derives from uh, the idea of this library chair that is a thing that converts into a ladder. Uh, where Ben Franklin's chair looks like something that's comfortable to sit in, and the Regency chair actually looks like, uh, in its form of scrolled arms and cane seats and curvilinear elements, uh, a kind of high Regency piece of style design. It seemed to me that, that perhaps a more modern approach uh, would be to ask a question which involves a kennel library chair, that is a chair which is also a ladder, uh, be expressive of that idea. In other words, what would it mean to make a chair look like a ladder? And that same question actually is couched within the history of the design of a chair as an object because there are things called a ladder back chair. So what we've got is a ladder back uh, folding library chair. Okay. These images will be familiar to the second year students who just finished uh, doing a typology course. One of the things that we talked about was uh, libraries as a use typology, but more importantly, what I'd like to do in looking at, uh, and I didn't do this building, I, I wish I had, uh, but uh, one of the things that, that can form a starting point for any design process or for the design of a library is to ask 
what some of the thematic architectural ideas that seem to be associated with libraries have been uh, over time. So the slides that we're looking at, which, which I think are really fabulous, are two images of the Laurentian Library. Uh, the one on the left-hand side is the library the way you normally see it. The other one is the library uh, apparently emptied for cleaning because uh, the books have all been taken away. And the books are contained in the desk uh, seat tables, those sort of wonderful piece of, of complicated furniture that Michelangelo designed. And one of the things that becomes immediately evident is that the architecture of the room, that is its apparent structure, the, the lattice of columns and then the gridded ceiling, which appears to bear on those columns, it isn't supported on anything. It sort of comes down and hits a plaster wainscot. So that the idea of what supports the ceiling, that is the columns, uh, and what supports the columns is actually a, a sort of metaphorical proposition. It's the books. So the idea of the books as structure, I think, is, is a big part of what the image on the right-hand side, which is actually Boulet's scheme for the uh, National Library in Paris. It was actually an addition scheme that was supposed to fill in a courtyard. And uh, one of the things that you can see is that it's a huge, kind of almost infinite and overpowering vaulted space the vault is held up by columns, but the columns sit on tiers of books, and one can make a reading of this drawing in which the tiers of books appear almost as coarse masonry. That is, they are a foundation wall that supports the structure of this architecture. And one might imagine, again, a kind of uh, metaphor here in which the books become the foundation of knowledge. Well, if this is all sort of grandiose, the, the images that I now want to show you, I hope, are far more modest. They're... Uh, a little project that Julie and I did for ourselves. Uh, as it turns out, we've got lots of books on art and design. We ran out of places to put them, and we made uh, the two columns that closed down the opening between the vestibule and the living room of the apartment that we live in. And they, the idea for those is bookcases, in a sense, mines what has always seemed to me to be this important thematic idea about libraries, which is that it is the books that not only define the space that you occupy when you go to use the library, but that, in fact, they can be the very structure the found, or the foundation that the architecture is built upon. The backside of those columns face into an entry hall, and again, the, the pieces do double duty. They become hall tables or console tables. There's a little mirror over them, and, and they're, again, uh, as architect somewhere between architecture and furniture, subsuming uh, uh, the functions of a number of different kinds of pieces of furniture. Okay. Another kind of furniture project that we did a few years back, which also deals with the idea of thematic trans transformation at a certain level, uh, is a little project that we did for the town of Seaside. The, the plan of Seaside is on the, on the left-hand side, and a kind of image of Seaside in the right, is on the right. Uh, Seaside is kind of this nostalgic, wonderful, uh, even horribly overdone Victorian uh, uh, real Disneyland, right? So that all of the houses there are cute. They're all pastel colors. They all have probably uh, way too much trellis on them. Uh, and uh, the project that we were asked to do was actually not a private commission. It was one of the public commissions uh, uh, given out by the developer of Seaside. And, and at the end of each of, can you all see this little uh, high-tech red dot here? Okay. Seaside is, is laid out around a town center, but each of the roads of private houses comes to the beach, which is the, the really wonderful thing and one of the main attractions of this area. And at the end of each of these things, there is a little pavilion which actually functions as a, a kind of toilet, changing area, storage shed, and a dune walkover, which is prescribed by local ecological law. In other words, you have to be three feet above the uh, uh, local vegetation. But symbolically, they also make gateways for each of those streets to the water. The image on the right-hand side is actually the first one built at the end of the first street to be developed. And as you can see, it literally... Uh, uh, takes a kind of historic motif, the Palladian arch, blows it up into a triumphal arch and makes this trellised uh, uh, gateway to the water. Uh, more interesting to me is the sort of image on the right-hand side, which is uh, a garden designed by uh, the German architect around the turn of the century, Peter Behrens, who uh, 
makes a series of spaces within the garden which are not architecture and not quite furniture and not quite landscape. They're done with the uh, semi-enclosure of the trellis work, and they are a kind of large-scale furniture when, uh, when one considers that they're more related visually to the Baron's designed furniture than they are to the kind of enclosure uh, made by leaves and trees, although, again, the leaves and trees are a kind of uh, transparent situation. Uh, what we did, I guess, reeling from the abundance of trellis work at, at Seaside was to say, uh, uh, what if we made something out of trellis work? How would you actually do this? And the idea that the trellis work, uh, which is sort of small scale and light and doesn't do very well uh, uh, in the uh, high moisture salt air and the winds that come off the gulf, what we proposed is that we could actually blow up the scale of this, that we could make a kind of structural bent out of the trellis work and at the same time kind of make a transformation of how the trellis work we made was understood in relation to the kind of image uh, of the town. Okay. The, the next project that I'd like to show you actually is uh, sort of getting closer to being buildings, right? If we looked at furniture as kind of microcosms, and I've tried to describe some of the issues that form them, uh, what I'd like to do is to look at a house remodeling, actually a townhouse remodeling. And uh, the existing condition of the townhouse was, was really interesting because it was one of a row of identical houses, but it was the end townhouse. And as you can see, it really is one of the row of the identical townhouses. There is actually no acknowledgement in the plan or the development of the rather blank side facade of the fact that this is a corner and actually always was. It was a corner when this was built. So the question uh, of what to do with this thing, which had been remodeled uh, about 10 years before we got there, uh, and you can sort of see a little bit of what it looked like, actually suggested that one had to bring to the process a, a, a problem statement, right? Making a, a fancy townhouse for the occupants, which is what they wanted, wasn't really an architectural problem. And it seemed to, to us that one could state the problem in typological terms. That is, if this is the normative condition of the townhouse, that is, that it has orientation or windows only front and back, has solid side walls, that something happens if you look at the planning of townhouses when, in fact, you have another orientation, that is, a third side. So the plan on the, on the uh, left-hand side is actually Robert Adams' Wynn House. The plan on the right-hand side is a townhouse in Boston by, uh, is it Boston or New York? I don't know, it's over there somewhere, if you can read it, by McKim, Mead, and White. Uh, I put them together because they have, have certain formal similarities. The rooms are actually shapes uh, uh, or what, what we've been calling figural uh, voids in the, uh, second, in the morphology course. Uh, the organization puts the stair and the kitchen and functional uses along uh, one side. But here, uh, where, it, where the rooms in the left-hand side uh, example only orient front and back, here there's a side orientation. The rooms are shaped to reflect that. And uh, where in this plan, there's actually uh, just some wall and storage stuff and a space in which to put plants or display sculpture that separates the two rooms. Here, there's actually a spatial development. The stair has been opened to the side, and there, in this case, is an entry hall. The entry's been moved from here to the side street, and there's a whole development of that center zone that takes place. In the... Uh, the plan that we made for the remodeling, uh, we did something somewhere in between these. In other words, we said, how do we recognize the, the third orientation and what does that mean? And then realized that we weren't in a position to add a side entrance and that because the house uh, had usable space of less than 1,300 square feet, we really weren't in a position to, uh, to, to make uh, what we initially thought we would do, which is a, a two-story hall uh, in the center of the plan. So, the, center, so the, the plan actually ends up being uh, uh, remarkably interesting as a kind of transformation of the Robert Adam plan, which is why they're put together as well. In the Adam plan, there are two spaces front to back and a kind of joint which is made out of solid material, which is part of the wall surface that shapes the space. Here, because the house is so small, the, the ground floor is 
one space that goes entirely from front to back, but the subdivision of the space into living dining, which is the subdivision in the Adam house, is actually affected not by a solid that has a shape or has the effect of shaping the rooms, but by a void space, that is a hole cut up two stories that effectively shapes those spaces. You can see the upper plan, so the stair comes up and there's a little overlook, and then this kind of miniature townhouse has a master bathroom suite here, a teeny master bedroom, both of which have bay windows that look to this interior space, and then there's actually a, a guest apartment on the ground floor which was, was not connected into the house. Oops, we need to get one to drop on this side. There we go. Okay. The, the right-hand condition is the house as we found it. The left-hand condition is the house as we remodeled it. You know what? Um, I'm out of sequence here, and I think that it's because a slide didn't drop. Can somebody hear me up there? We can't go back? Okay, that's all right. So let's get another image here. Uh, if you remember the one that we just lost, which is the, um, the one that showed the existing condition of the house, in addition to sort of the, the issues of how, how to make a plan for this house, what to do being based on a kind of typological understanding of the conditions of the house, we also wanted to reinvent the elements of the architecture of the house, that is, of the remodeling co from the component parts that we found in the original, that is, the window and door trim, base molding and ceiling trim. Uh, that doesn't get you architecture, and it doesn't uh, uh, even get you uh, uh, a house, but in fact, uh, what we did in the process of interconnecting uh, the, the spaces front to back was to use those elements of trim, which we reproduced as a, as a spatial system to, to help define what's actually going on here. And we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how, it, how that happens here and a little bit more about what you see in this uh, image, which is the sidewall here, which is actually a divider between the two spaces, which is a cabinet that forms a window between the two. But for now, I'd like to move on. Uh, uh, this is, sorry, this is... Uh, the last set of images of this, and it's looking up that vertical space that we made so that the second floor actually protrudes into uh, uh, the space from above, completes uh, an understanding of the space on the ground floor as being three spaces, and then when we actually look at the house at, at dusk from the outside and see into it the, the kind of uh, spatial conception of this thing as both spaces and solid volumes within a larger single envelope, a box, if you will, is actually made clear. It's sort of a Le Corbusier idea, which is that you actually bound a space and then begin to set into it elements which are solid and formed that modulate the space. So the two upper bays actually face off against one another and look like volumes inserted uh, into that box. Uh, one of the typological issues of the linear townhouse that we uh, just looked at, uh, as well as grid plans in general, is the treatment of the center. This is a house done uh, about 12 years ago. It's actually in many ways very much like the townhouse we just looked at. The zoning of the functional stuff happens entirely along a north wall. This is on a little crest of a hill and faces a view through the woods to a little lake. Uh, the spaces on the main level, which is actually uh, up from where you enter, are a living room, a dining room, a family room, kitchen that form a three-part division. And the dining room, which is the most important uh, functional and spatial element for my clients within the house, is actually treated as a shaped space, that is a figured or figural void that sits within the idea of the whole box as a large container. On the upper floor, uh, uh, there's a little alcove area here, a sliding door that allows the whole space to be seen. That's a rail for a mezzanine, and from the floor below, you can actually see the oval space sitting within the space of the larger box, and then the registration of the center uh, set up both by the stack of windows and by the circular skylight in its crossing. Uh, as, as we looked at in the typology classes, if you can make the center of, uh, of something a void, you can also make the center of something a solid, that is an, occup uh, an occupiable space versus 
uh, a, a solid space or something that one doesn't occupy, although in this case, uh, one ascends it. So the center of this plan, which again is zoned very similarly, that is uh, a living room, dining room, a kitchen, fireplace, stair, and then entry, mudroom, bathroom zone along one wall, the center of it is actually a solid, which is a, a, a figure. That is, it sits in the space and actually makes you feel the space going around it, but it's comprised of a stair that comes down as a shape, the bottom of which becomes a, a little bench to sit on next to a tiled fireplace, and then uh, actually the, uh, the kitchen uh, is behind that counter. Are we actually losing part of the uh, image off the screen there? No, it's fine. I'm just looking at it wildly foreshortened. <laughs> Oops. Oh, uh, we're having problems with one of the projectors. Now, is there somebody up there? No. No, we've got to go back two images. What happens is when I hit it, it's switching twice. There we go. That's great. Maybe you could, whoever is up there could just keep listening, and I'll let you know if something doesn't drop. Um, in each of the projects that I presented thus far, uh, I've dealt with the choice of architectural forms and architectural language as if it were a de dependent rather than a free choice. Uh, over the years, I've actually come to think of the work that we do as a series of additions to an already existing environment. The desire to find a place for our work within the fabric of things began, I think, probably pretty literally uh, with the process of making additions and remodelings to existing buildings and ultimately, I think, became a point of view about uh, architecture that we've extended to new construction. So uh, we do uh, maybe one or two uh, house additions uh, per year. And this is actually the very first one that I ever built, which is 1974. Um, it's a sort of dreadful... Uh, house with not much going for it. Uh, uh, I'm not at all embarrassed by it. Uh, what it does is it takes the house absolutely at face value and it proposes making more space by a actually fairly complicated extension of what's there. So the gable is split and the end is pulled out to, so that we can actually make a little courtyard because it's a corner of a fairly busy street. So this space, which is all glass, looks into an enclosed area, and then the system of the house, that is the forms that are already there, and particularly what the windows do when they turn the corner, is sort of used to generate the architecture. There's a double-hung window, a picture window, everybody knows what they are, right? They're the main component of this kind of ranch house. A solid masonry post, more window, and then the sequence ends in a double-hung window. So here, the corner is turned, there's, that's the last window. There's uh, uh, windows, or it's actually glass doors that come across a post, and then the whole system is turned again uh, with that double-hung window. The, that kind of a strategy, uh, which I characterize as extension uh, of the thing, uh, and, and I guess also involves a kind of value judgment in which the thing is sort of taken uh, at face value, is actually something that still uh, generates uh, the, the decisions about most of our work. This is a very recent uh, uh, house edition that we completed. You can see the existing condition in the top drawing, which corresponds to the uh, slide on the right-hand side. What we did was to make a kind of stretch limo version of it and to actually <clears throat> uh, tie the thing together uh, as well as articulate it into parts by using a compositional device that involves <clears throat> the arcade, which is this uh, uh, piece here where you get to the back door, and the, a column which is made as its center, which has a dormer centered over it and pairs two sets of windows. The other dormer right now, one can imagine, is part of a compositional center of elements and then the other kind of window that occurs, which is the porch window here, which is a wood window, is actually used as a little square center there and then a making element that makes sort of secondary centers for this thing. Uh, let's see, this is what it looks like. And then uh, uh, the view of it from the end. Uh, part of the program was more bedrooms and garages, so the spaces inside of this are fairly modest. You can see the arcade at this point. And uh, the idea of the elements was not just to extend them, but as with that first edition that I showed, to make a kind of uh, studied uh, transformation of them. 
So that what is in fact a kind of uh, uh, mysterious and funky corner detail, right? There's a, a thing which is not quite a brick pier with this little piece of stuff sitting on top of it, and then the corner gets these sort of projecting things. That becomes a, a, a visual system in which one imagines that that's actually an embedded column capital uh, and is used then as part of the structural pier as a real column capital by facing it in as a cruciform in four directions. Um, let's see, I didn't do this, but it's one that I admire a lot. Okay? It's Frank Gehry's uh, addition to his own house of some years ago. And it also, like the jobs that we've looked at, involves the idea of a transformation of materials. But in this case, even though Gary uh, is, is and was at that point sort of noted for the use of industrial materials, there is an alternate reading that I would offer of this house, which I find very interesting. Okay? If it is a kind of modest and totally undistinguished architectural uh, uh, little, it's not a bungalow, it's not one story, but little stuccoed house, what it's, what's happened is it's been wrapped with another element. Okay? The uh, element is, in fact, made out of corrugated siding, which is textured and might be read as a kind of transformation of residential siding, either vertical or horizontal siding. Uh, we can imagine uh, that the screening, which kind of makes a trans, uh, transparent definition of a space over the entryway, could, in fact, be a transformation of trellising, uh, even the front stoop is rendered uh, simultaneously as conventional stoop leading to conventional house and stoop uh, uh, abstracted into a series of planes or trays that simply step up and make a stair, but a transformation of our understanding of stair. Inside, the same kind of reflexive transformation is being made. The bay window of the original house becomes the site for glass-fronted kitchen cabinets. We'll talk about this as a thematic idea a little bit later, right? that one has a, has a, a window that separates space and a window into a cabinet as a kind of separator of space. But look at the, the polygonal bay that Gary has made, which is actually a spatial registration of the bay of its house. Okay? It seems to me that without belaboring the point, uh, uh, and while, it, while I've talked about transformations, that one could also uh, suggest that there is a, a typology of additions if one imagines that the existing building is somehow unfinished or incomplete, that it's a fragment of a larger whole, uh, and that we might then somehow go on to complete it or propose a completion of it. The two additions I did uh, complete the structure by a very simple method of making an extension of them. Gary's addition is also an extension, but it's a more complicated one. It's a concentric one that wraps the house and is reflexive to the house. And what I would suggest is that in a funny way it makes the kind of more radical transformation of the elements understandable, you know, because they're set in a one-to-one -one relationship to the thing that they are things that they are transforming. Now, many additions uh, simply add a new fragment to an existing structure. Uh, and while this may cause us to re-examine the relationships between the new thing and the old parts, the strategy doesn't create a new entity out of our combined perception of those parts. I guess, lastly, uh, uh, while I admire this house a lot architecturally, one is, one is left to ask a question which I'm not going to raise in this lecture, which is, what does it mean to do this? What does it mean to take a, a, a genuinely modest house in a, in a neighborhood of other modest houses and to wrap it up in industrial materials? Uh, what, what are we to assume Gary is saying to his neighbors about the meaning and quality of their architecture versus the uh, meaning and quality of his uh, transformed house? How uh, are we to uh, understand uh, uh, that as, a, as, a, as an act of making a uh, place and making architecture. <clears throat> well, having backed into the use of traditional architecture, at least suggested that we sort of did that, uh, I think I can say that I'm interested in systems of architectural ornament as if they were found objects rather than the subject of formal invention. Architectural theory, or at least what, what used to be called architectural theory, distinguishes ornament from decoration 
Decoration is applied while ornament is thought of as integral to a work, conceived and developed as an elaboration of some aspect of architecture. Uh, if you've spent any time looking at architectural magazines lately, you may have noticed a re real revival of interest in the ornamental elaboration of construction and construction joints, fasteners, and the materials of construction. Uh, and a lot of it is quite beautiful. Uh, we can also observe that architecture can be made by an elaboration of structure, an ornamental elaboration of surface, and an elab the elaboration of space. So the first two images uh, clearly are an elaboration of structure. Uh, Michelangelo grids and, and contains and defines the Laurentian library, which we looked at before, with the application of the elements of a supportive structure. Uh, Peter Eisenman takes the real structure of the Wexner Center, uh, the, the grid that it establishes, uh, columns that hang from the ceiling, the trellis work, and makes an ornamental elab elaboration of the structural grid of the building into all the other aspects of the building in a way which is very much like Renaissance architecture, at least in that aspect. Uh, we can also talk about the elaboration of surface, what it means to draw on or texture surface in relation to the way in which we perceive defined space, whether it's the interior space of, of this Robert Adam uh, room or whether it's the exterior space that's made by the curving wall at the front of Le Corbusier's uh, 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 chapel at uh, Ronchamp, France. Uh, for me, in terms of the work that I do, the thing that interests me most, which is probably no secret in the morphology course, is actually architectural space. So it's the elaboration of space that uh, I, I want to examine. And uh, if we look at the whole idea of the elements of architecture and even the ornamental ar elements of architecture as being uh, uh, designed or disposed in service of that process of ornamental elaboration, the uh, uh, Martin House in Buffalo by Frank Lloyd Wright proposes a series of overlapping uh, uh, rectangular spaces that read through one another and then are sort of sorted out into uh, uh, primary volumes and secondary volumes by the way in which a system of horizontal trim and beams read uh, through one another or in fact provide continuity where one space slides into another if you look at the image on the right. Uh, this is uh, on the left hand side is Frank Lloyd Wright again. It's the dining room at the Ward Willits House in Highland Park. Look at, again, the way in which the definition of this as a, as a single space with spaces within it is affected. Part of it has to do with the trim. Part of it has to do with the fact that the bay, which is part of the space, is made also to read as a separate diamond or lozenge space by inscribing the completion of its volume on the ceiling, the grid of lights, uh, over the table and in registration with the table make a subdivided volume, the return of the door, the way this carries across, and the crown folds back, making a, a space that cross-registers with the window, are all part of a complicated spatial construction which is made visible and reinforced by the use of these pieces. In the Kerrigan house, the idea, the townhouse that we looked at before, the idea of the living room as a single space with two spaces in it is initially shaped by the cutout in the ceiling, the void that goes up through it. The continuity is made by the base trim and the uh, chair rail and the crowns that slide through the openings to the side of, to, or to either side of those piers that, that the doors that close the dining room off fold against, right? So what we've got uh, for the sake of terminology uh, in, the, in the morphology courses is a spatial opening, one in which the defining, uh, one of the defining walls of a space slides past one of the other defining surfaces. The other thing is, if you look at the way in which the trim works, right, the back of the room is actually rounded by a soffit, if you remember the plan. The crown trim turns around, it comes across straight at the back and implies the plane made by the back of these piers, the space itself is shaped by the oval on the ceiling whose focuses are the twin uh, lighting fixtures. The fireplace, which is off-center in a strange way, has been centered with the center of the cabinet across from it and is one of the focuses of the, uh, of the 
complicated oval space. The other cross axis is the is a window alongside the fireplace which was existing and is out of the photograph and the opening you saw before into the room. On top of the fireplace is a uh, mirror, an overmantel mirror, and it's opposite the glass cabinet, which is a window with glass on either side of it. Uh, so there's a kind of stabilization of this as a space within a space by the complete construction of it as a voided geometric figure. Uh, including the uh, bay above, which completes a reading of the larger oval of the ceiling. Okay. Now, as part of our interest in the elaboration of space, uh, the window is a separator of inside from outside or as a separator of spaces, that is, the space we're in from the space we, uh, that's beyond us, is actually a thematic uh, idea that runs through the work that we do, and I'd like to look at it very briefly. Here's the, that townhouse again, and as you can see, uh, the cabinet is a kind of window uh, from uh, the little tiny kitchen into the dining room. Uh, there's an another break front, dining room break front in a different townhouse remodeling shown here with an elaborate piece of cabinet work which has... Uh, uh, upper glass cabinets which are flanked by uh, a window to the outside and a window into a uh, secondary egress stair. Here's a plan of that, and what you can see is that the main spaces of the, this townhouse are, again, a front room, living room, and a dining room as a back room. The front room has got a three-part window here, and then the other end is, in fact, a th uh, two windows and a glass cabinet and, uh, in fact, a mirrored backsplash, which actually reflects the front window, so that here we're looking into to the real outside, and here we're actually looking into the, uh, the stair that goes up uh, so that the uh, kids can come down and sit there and watch Mommy and Daddy have dinner parties, which is actually a memory that I have from, uh, from my childhood. Uh, some more examples uh, that probably need not be commented on the, the wall of windows, the wall of cabinets is glass, the hutches with the uh, uh, French doors that were original to the house here. This is actually the hutches and the kitchen are, uh, are our work. Uh, another little kitchen uh, in Highland Park uh, done with, uh, with Julie. Actually, it's for Julie's mother. How can you do better than that? It's in a very wonderful little arts and crafts house. And the idea of the, the cabinet uh, the upper glass cabinet is, is a piece of furniture, almost like a hutch, set against the wall, actually allows us to get around a, a kind of nasty problem where the cabinets actually, uh, because of dimensions uh, of the existing window, would have come out in front of it. The, the breakfast area, again, has built-in glass cabinets that flank a French door uh, out to a deck, which uh, will be built very shortly. Uh, Okay, what I've tried to do is to present analytically some of the ideas that compromise the building blocks of our work. The last two projects I want to show, I'd like to just present as a kind of synthesis of, of these uh, issues and ideas with uh, far fewer comments. Um, it's a big house opposite the lake in Highland Park. It steps forward on its site. There's an idea of the, uh, I guess, a Wrightian idea, again, of the space made between layers of things. So there's a banding, as in... Wright's later work of strips of windows and strips of, of roof and strips of balcony and terrace uh, with a, a vertical piece that pops up, which is uh, developed from the section of the house inside. The living room is actually on the second floor to provide views of the lake. Uh, one comes into a lower uh, entry hall with the stair off to one side, and it's at that point that the spatial organization of the house is explained. The upper uh, space is shaped into a high space and then a space underneath the actual shape of the roof construction and that space is formed uh, as a series of uh, registered vaults uh, and, and uh, I guess uh, arch head windows. Uh, this is looking back into the living room and the arch head window that's over the fireplace is actually a room into uh, or, or a window from an inside room, a mezzanine to the actual space and as one continues up the stair, which is back in this corner, there's a landing with a set of French doors to a space which has a window that overlooks an interior space, and the, uh, our clients cleverly decided what they needed was a big tree in there so that when you're up here and you look out uh, into a space flooded from 
with light from above. What you see is a tree. So the idea of, of inside and outside is being played with here. Uh, a house that we've just completed, uh, very different from this one, uh, which actually sits at the end of the street and uh, is extended and curved in the front to sort of pr- try and define a space, uh, the, the space of entry onto the site, the space of entry within uh, the clearing of trees that form uh, this site. The back, uh, where, the, where the front is very closed and private and makes a motor court, uh, the back is actually sort of cut away in plastic and shelters a space against the arm here, which is the living room, uh, with a kind of continuous modern space, which is the dining room bay, fam- uh, breakfast area, family room. There's a little terrace that works off the twin, uh, the, the jargon is master, or the vernacular is master suites, which are up above. Uh, the house is stuccoed, and the high windows, the dormer windows here, light a double story space, and here actually light a double story stair hall and stair element. So if we look at the thing from the outside, there are pictures of the front uh, moving around the back, and you can see the back terrace. The stonework hasn't gone in yet. Here's the, the terrace space. That big window that you saw cut into the, uh, the chimney from the uh, uh, fireplace in, in the living room actually is a window that spatially registers with a big uh, uh, balcony window at the end of an upper hallway. Uh, that's probably a little bit clearer if we look at the plan so here's the curved front. There's an entry door, and the hallway is, or the entry space is actually a continuous space which is subdivided. Uh, it's subdivided by, first of all, being open vertically. That's open, and that's open. You come where the stair goes up. You come in in a one-story space. You're between a pair of columns. The little landing here uh, is at a level with the window, and actually looks back through here, which faces south folds back through an opening underneath the roof above and forms a bay, dining bay, another kind of faceted bay element, which is breakfast area, and then continues into the family room. So the idea of this is sort of continuous space rather than formed or figural space is really what the house is about. Uh, the, the house on the right is the plan, uh, or the plan on the right is, is Le Corbusier's Villa Savoy, which is uh, a, an, a, a kind of idealized house that sits in the landscape uh, uh, as an object. Uh, the, the entry sequence and the stair hall of, of this house were actually thought of as a kind of inversion of that. Uh, sequence. That is, where the car arrives from Paris, you drive under this thing here, under shelter, and then into the garage, and, and the curve of the house is the turning radius of the car. Here, the curve of the house makes a space in the landscape, but is, in fact, the turning radius of the car. Here, where the structural system is actually split to accommodate the stair ramp that goes up, that split from the grid here to the grid there, actually leaves us with two columns which stand against the curve of the wall in much the same way that those two columns which support the floor uh, above actually define a space within the space that you've entered and make a kind of portal of that condition. This is a very old picture of the Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier. They were remodeling it, the bidet uh, later, uh, got, we hope, got installed in the proper place. I actually haven't been back. But as you see, you come through the glass wall, and you're actually in a space defined by the pair of columns making a kind of entry plane and portal. The drop beam, uh, the, the directionality of the whole thing is emphasized by that other beam, and even the little cutout for the, for the rug further defines that space. At, at this house in Glencoe, one comes in to a wedge-shaped low space, which is, continues through the glass doors, that little pop-out balcony that shelters or tries to shelter the entrance. There's the pairing of the columns, and then the stair here comes down uh, again in the zone of those columns, but uh, laterally rather than perpendicularly as a wood form that sticks out into and further subdivides or modifies that space. And I said I wasn't going to say a lot about this, huh? Uh, Okay. This is a, a sketch and a view having come up the stair and looking sort of back, and you can see the way in which the upper ceiling 
here and those things that look like dormers from the front are actually top lighting that space. And then finally, uh, let's see if we can get the image on the left hand side. Anybody up there? Okay, can you get that to drop? Hello? It's the last picture of the evening. <laughs> We're finished. I have four more things to say, and then we can, you can all either wake up or go and have cheese and wine, because I know you're starving. Uh, the living room space and that wall that I described in plan, which is glass, and folds around through that opening and then just continues on its way to, interconnect, to spatially interconnect as well as define uh, all of the elements. Okay. Uh, I don't really have a conclusion for all of this. Um, uh, if you'll forgive the pun, I, I'm still practicing architecture. Uh, I do, however, have a favorite quote that I'd like to end with, which might relate to the topic of the evening. And it's from uh, a book called The Education of Henry Adams. And Adams uh, writes, images are not arguments. They rarely ever lead to proofs, yet the mind craves them nonetheless. Thank you very much.